Our scripture reading this evening is John chapter 4, verses 34 and 35. John 4, 34 and 35. Jesus says unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Don't you say there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes. Look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. My brethren, we, as Christians, are in the building business, or we're not in God's business. Because it is the responsibility of every Christian, as Steve said, to be a builder of the kingdom of God, the most beautiful and the most lovely thing that exists in all of this world. The Bible says that we are builders with God. And so while we are doing what we can and what we should, to build a beautiful church to the glory of God, we are building with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9 says, For we are God's fellow workers. We are God's fellow workers. We are working with God in the building of a beautiful church to the glory of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1, the Bible says, we then, as workers together with him, working with God, working with Jesus Christ, working with the Holy Spirit through the use of his word, we are busy working in God's business or we're in the wrong business. As we go about the business of building a beautiful church to the glory of God, what better way to do that than to look upon the fields and see that they are white in the harvest, the laborers are few, and we do everything in our power to rescue those who are perishing. Jude reminds us in Jude verses 20 through 22. But you, brethren, are beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. We're living tonight in a world of more than 7 billion people. That's a staggering thing to me. About the time I get caught up to understand what they're talking about when they talk about millions, then they start talking about billions. Now we're beginning to even talk about trillions when we talk about how much we're in debt. And so somewhere along the line, they almost lose me. When I think about 7 billion people plus living in our world, and when I think that millions or even billions of them have never heard of the cross of Christ, they've never held a Bible in their hand, they've never heard a gospel sermon, they don't have a clue that they're lost, it makes me think more seriously about the responsibility that we have to snatch people out of the fire. We really have a serious responsibility to look, lift up our eyes on that harvest. If the world is not saved, it's not because there is a lack of harvest. If the church doesn't grow, it isn't because there is a lack of potential. It may be because we as builders of the body of Christ don't understand yet. 
what it means to build a beautiful church to the glory of the Lord by rescuing those who are perishing. Since the Garden of Eden, it has been God's plan to have man reconciled to Him. It is God's plan for man to be redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. It is God's plan that we as Christians take the gospel to a lost and dying world, doing everything we can to build a beautiful church to the glory of God by rescuing people who are perishing. One of the saddest statements that you read in the Bible says, last of all, he sent his son. God not only sent his son into the world to save the world, but he told you and me that we have a responsibility to go tell the world about that. Go tell the world that I sent my son into the world to die for their sins. God has a plan to save the world. The Bible makes that abundantly clear. And I love to teach people, especially in one-on-one -on -one Bible studies, who are honest and sincere and who are willing to open that Bible and study what it says and see and understand that God has a plan to save us. And they are willing to submit themselves to that plan. It is a way that demands strict obedience to the will of God. There isn't any other way. I mean, you're just not going to accidentally stumble into heaven. You're not going to ride somebody else's goodness and go to heaven. God has a plan. And that plan demands strict obedience to his will. That's why when I hear somebody say or I read the, in somebody's paper that all you need to do is believe in Jesus Christ and and, and uh, accept him as your personal savior and everything's just fine. The only thing wrong with that is that it's wrong. It's just not in the Bible. That's not God's plan to save the world. Just pray the sinner's prayer, some people say. Even some uh, who claim to be gospel preachers. Just pray the sinner's prayer. Well, you'll not find that in the Bible either. Look. God demands strict obedience to his will. God's not mean. God's not hard. God doesn't want us to be lost. God wants us to be saved, and he's provided a way to do that, and he demands that we obey his will. <coughs> Secondly, it is a way, it is a plan that cannot be changed. Culture may change. Circumstances may change, but God's plan of salvation doesn't change. When I first went to Romania, my lady and me, and we got back home and people would ask me, and they still do quite often, somebody would say, what do you teach when you go to Romania? Well, I teach the gospel. It's just one. That's one of the beautiful things about it. There's just one gospel for gravel hillians and Romanians and Russians and all out of the whole world. Just one gospel. And it cannot be changed. We cannot substitute something else. We must be saved through obedience to the gospel. The gospel is still God's power to save the world. Romans 1 and the verse is 16. So I want to talk to you tonight. We're just family. Nobody here but us. I want us to think tonight about responsibility that we have to rescue people who are perishing and in so doing build a beautiful church to the glory of God. 
I said in the beginning, we're in the building business. If we're not, we'd better be. You think about it a moment. What would uh, the Gravel Hill Church of Christ be like tonight if those who have gone before us had not been builders? You know, I, I, we were in Casa Grande, Arizona, and I met Charlie Mellon. He said, I'm from Arkansas. Oh, you are? Where? Oh, he said, you wouldn't know. I said, well, I might. He said, do you know where Russellville is? Yeah, I don't live far from Russellville. Well, it's not there, he said, where I came from. Do you know where Dover is? Yeah. Finally, he wanted to know if I knew where Gum Log Road was. And I said, yeah, I know all that. Well, Gravel Hill people through the years have been builders. And you think with me tonight a moment about what the church at Gravel Hill will be 20 years from now or 50 years from now when I come back to hold a meeting if we're not builders right now. If we're not builders, what's going to happen? When we get busy building a beautiful church to the glory of God by rescuing the perishing, then the church is going to grow. I get asked that a lot. When do you think the church is going to start growing like it did back in the 50s or the 60s or whatever? Well, it's going to start growing when Ted starts growing because who is the church anyway? It's me and you. When we start growing, then the church is going to grow. And one of the ways that we need to grow is in the rescuing of perishing people. Get out and drive up and down the roads in this community. You go into Dover and go on into Russellville and go on to Little Rock and just look around you a minute and you're completely surrounded by people who need to be rescued. The fields are indeed white. Well, what does the word rescue mean? The word rescue means to free from confinement, danger, or evil. We, we can understand what rescue means. Somebody's house catches on fire and somebody seems to be uh, in the house and can't get out and firemen come or neighbors come or whoever and somebody rushes into the building and pulls them out. They've been rescued from confinement, from danger, from something that's terrible. So we understand what the word rescue means tonight, don't we? We got that down, surely. We have got that down. Well, what about the word perishing? The word perishing means to pass away completely, to be destroyed or ruined, to die as races that have perished from the earth. Somebody is dying. They're perishing. Somebody's being destroyed being ruined in some circumstance. They're perishing. Somebody is confined. And they're perishing unless somebody comes to rescue them. And so when I read these definitions of the words rescue and perishing, I get to picture the sense of someone who is passing away Someone who's being ruined. Someone who is dying a spiritual death. And someone comes with a Bible in his hand and teaches them the gospel and rescues them from that perishing state. Isn't that something? That's the greatest thing that we can imagine. If you've never had the privilege of studying the Bible with somebody and they're responding to the gospel in a positive way, in humble obedience to the will of God, you've missed one of the great blessings of life. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And we're living in a world of billions of people who need to be taught. Well, there's some things I want us to think about as we consider this idea of building a beautiful church to the glory of God. Number one. We've got to acknowledge, we've got to understand that people who are not Christians are really lost. Now listen to me. 
You can't get mad at me. I love you or I wouldn't even be here. I'd be home watching gun smoke. <laughs> I'm here not to just enjoy our fellowship together. I'm here tonight to talk to you about rescuing perishing people. And through doing that, building a beautiful church to the glory of God. And in order to do that, we've got to come to the knowledge of the fact that people who have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ are lost people. And I don't say that to insult anybody or to abuse anybody or to make anybody get upset. I say that because that's what the Bible says. People who have not obeyed the Lord are lost. I sometimes wonder if we have not lulled ourselves into thinking that this neighbor of mine is a good man. He's a good citizen. He's a good husband, a good father. He's he just a really good man. And so surely, uh, even though he hasn't obeyed the gospel, even though he, he hasn't uh, become a child of God, He's still okay because he's such a good person. We may have lulled ourselves into thinking that, but that's not the truth. We talk about our family members who have never obeyed the gospel. Oh, yes, I, I know, but we they've been brought up in the church is the way we usually put it and so forth and and they know right from wrong and, and they live a good life and they are good people and so so surely they're saved. Not if they haven't obeyed the gospel, they're not. They're lost. They are lost people. Are we really being honest with ourselves when we allow ourselves to be convinced that obedience is not necessary? Would you listen to a few passages? Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, did you get that? It's not me talking. It's the Lord. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father who is in heaven. Now, who is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven? Those who do the will of God. Isn't that right? I got one of the preachers at Levy that I've known for many, many years. He'll be just preaching away and he'll say, isn't that right? And everybody just sits there like a stump like you just did. And so he says, that's right. He answers his own question. So I'll answer my own question. That's right. Those who are obedient to the gospel, those are the ones who, if they remain faithful, are going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 14 says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Now, who is it that has a right to the tree of life? Who is it that's going to enter in through those gates into the city? Well, it's those that do the Lord's commandments. You don't do the Lord's commandments. You're not going there. You're lost. Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. Jesus asked, Why? Do you call me Lord, Lord, and then do not the things that I say? When I was at Harding in the former century, Brother Marshall Keeble, one of the greatest gospel preachers that's ever lived, came to Harding to speak in chapel. The only time I ever saw him or heard him speak. And Brother Keeble was talking about some of these passages that I'm talking about tonight. And he said, would you get down on your knees and you cry out, Lord, Lord, 
and you have not obeyed the gospel, it's like getting on a telephone and hollering hello when it ain't plugged in. Isn't that right? Yes, that is right. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. He shall be revealed from heaven with his angels and mighty uh, fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God and who obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now what's going to happen? Next verse. They shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of God and the glory of his power. People who haven't obeyed the gospel are perishing tonight. I sometimes get in a large group of people, maybe at a sporting event or in an airport especially, I was sitting in, air, in the airport in Atlanta one time. Thousands and thousands of people, some of them running to make their next flight, and people just all in a rush, and just mobs of people. And I sat there just watching, and I thought, every person that I see is either a Christian or needs to be. Every last one of them. They are either Christians or they are prospects for teaching. They are people who need to be taught because people who have not obeyed the Lord are lost. No matter how upright one may be according to our standards, that person who hasn't obeyed the gospel is lost. Secondly, if we're going to become rescuers of those who are perishing and thereby build a beautiful church to the glory of God, we've got to realize that rescue and freedom are available. Isn't that the best news you ever heard? We don't, have to, we don't have to stay in a state of confinement. We don't have to remain in a, sta a state of danger or evil, a perishing state. We don't have to stay there because salvation is available. That's the best news that you've ever heard in all of your life. It's a tragic situation when there is danger and death and rescue isn't possible. I've spoken at two triple funerals in my life. Both of them, three people, lost their lives very, very tragically. Three in an automobile accident. Three little boys in a fire in their home. Mother got up, her father got up to go to work. His truck wouldn't start. Mother got up and took him to work, was gone maybe five to seven minutes. When she came back home, the house engulfed. And little boys, 12, 10, and 5 in that house. People had gathered and, and came rushing. They, wanted, they did everything in their power, but they could not rescue them. That's terrible. Terrible, and it's tragic. Rescue is not available. I'm telling you tonight, a person who is lost in sin, if you're not a child of God tonight and you're lost in sin, it's possible for you to be rescued. Isn't that something? It is possible for you to be set free from your sins. God wants every person to be rescued. Do you know what John 3.16 says? Of course you do. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God wants every single soul in this world to be saved. God would have all men to be saved, to come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 
Peter says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to a knowledge of the truth. Not one person is going to be lost because it was impossible for them to be saved because freedom and rescue is available. I just love that. I walk up and down the streets in Romania every day as I take my usual walk. People are walking everywhere. They don't have as many automobiles as we do. People still walk. And sometimes it's almost impossible to get through the crowds. These are people who are perishing. They're lost. And here I am with my Bible under my arm trying to tell them rescue is available. You're confined, but you can be free. And what a joy it is when we have the opportunity to teach some of those people. So, people who are not Christians are lost. Rescue and freedom from sin is available. Number three, the only hope for rescue for those who are perishing is Jesus Christ. The only hope. I, I like uh, the way the Lord narrows down our choices. The Lord doesn't say that there are two dozen ways through which or by which a person may be saved from his sins. There's just one way. And he said it himself, didn't he? John 14 and the verses 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Do we get it? No man comes unto the Father but by me. Jesus just narrows it down. There is just one hope of rescue, and that hope is Jesus Christ. Not Muhammad, not the Pope, not Blondie, Jesus Christ. First time I went to Romania, we had big banners hanging over the streets and signs on all of the poles and the, about every kind of newspaper ads that we have come here to preach Jesus Christ. In the first study I ever had, two young ladies, ages 23 and 18, and after we had exchanged our greetings a little bit, I said, do you have any questions? The younger of the two said, who is Jesus Christ? She saw all these advertisements. When I saw those things, I knew who Jesus Christ was. She didn't. And I was very happy to open the New Testament and study with those two young ladies, both of whom became Christians. One a few years later passed away with a terrible disease, but she died in Christ. Mm. Jesus Christ is the only hope for people who are confined in sin and need to be rescued. Well, if you must be in Christ, that brings up the question, how do I get into Christ? Well, I'm glad you asked that because the Bible answers it. Romans chapter 6. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, that person who is buried, that person who is baptized into Christ is in Christ. That's what it means. And that's how one finds himself in Christ. Galatians chapter 3. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ did put on Christ. The Roman, uh, Romanians do not have a word for our English word into. And so I, I just kept teaching, baptized into Christ. And they didn't know what I meant. They just have the, the word in. We are baptized in Christ. And so 
I would explain to them what this word into means. Faith and repentance and confession brings you unto entrance into the body of Christ. Baptism puts you in Christ, into the church, and so on. One must be in Christ Jesus. Folks, there's just not any other way. There's just not any other way. You may leave here tonight and feel like I've been abusive to you or insulting to you if you do not believe these things to be true. But bless your hearts, there isn't any way I can get in a car and go home tonight and know that I didn't tell the truth. And the truth is that one must be in Christ Jesus because that's the only hope for rescue that is. Then... When one is in Christ Jesus, he must walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. He must walk in the light and not in darkness. That's called faithfulness. That's called commitment. That's called loyalty, steadfastness, constancy. We keep on living a faithful Christian life. A child of God who walks after fleshly things just as lost as he can be. The person who becomes a child of God and then does not live according to what the scriptures say is just as lost as he can be and he needs to repent and return and begin walking after the Spirit again. The child of God who's walking in darkness is just as lost in that darkness as he can be. But he can be restored. He can rededicate his life. He can begin living a faithful life. Let's not be like Peter who described in 2 Peter chapter 2 the child of God who is no longer living a faithful life. He compares him to a dog that eats his own vomit and to a hog that wallows in the mire. The only hope that the alien sinner has to be rescued is Jesus Christ. Now, here's the deal. The things that I've discussed with you tonight emphatically teach that a person is separated from God because of sin. But that person may be rescued from that lost state through the obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ and that's the only way it can be done and then Jesus said be faithful unto death and I'll give you a crown of life and here is the bottom line knowing all of that Knowing all of that, and we know that, don't we? We know that. What I told you tonight is the truth. What are we supposed to do about it? We've sung that song ever since I was a child, Rescue the Perishing. We've sung another old song, Throw Out the Lifeline. That's my job. That's your job. What do you do when you talk to somebody at work about their soul? You're throwing out the lifeline. What do you do when you talk to a schoolmate about the, what's going to happen to their soul? You're throwing out the lifeline. Listen, people say we need to be our brother's keeper. Hmm. We cannot be our brother's keeper until we become our brother's seeker. We've got to go seek the lost. We've sung that too. Forever and ever. Seeking the lost. Seeking the lost. Our Lord commanded us to be rescuers. The Lord taught us to be rescuers. He set the example. He gave his life to rescue people. And then he said to us, you go tell people about that. You go tell people about that. 
What's going to happen to the Gravel Hill Church if you don't go tell people about that? It's going to dry up one of these days. That cemetery is going to get fuller and fuller. Who's going to replace those who will be out there? We are responsible to be rescuers. And when we are, not only are we blessed tremendously personally, but we will build a beautiful church to the glory of God. I read on Facebook today, it may have been on the Gospel Preacher's page, but a man said, we had a baptism. Did you read that, Brad? Yes, we had a baptism Sunday for the first time in how many years did he say? Seven or eight. Yeah. Well, in fact, he went on to say, nobody knows how long it's been since we have baptized anybody into Christ. What's going to happen? If that church doesn't turn things around, it's going to die. Because the only way, the major way at least, that we can build a beautiful church to the glory of God is to rescue those who are perishing in sin by teaching them the gospel of Jesus and teaching them how to live a faithful Christian life and encouraging each other in our journey from this life to heaven. Tonight, if you're not a Christian, what's holding you back? What's causing you to not obey the gospel? Why will you not surrender your life to Jesus Christ? I'm not asking you to do some hard thing. I'm not asking you to do something that's distasteful and obnoxious. And I'm asking you to come out of that confined state in sin through obedience to the gospel to freedom in Christ. You shall know the truth, Jesus said, and the truth shall make you free. Freedom. That's what we're longing for. You can be made free tonight before you walk out the doors of this building. If you will come to Jesus, repenting of your sins, confessing that Jesus is the Son of God, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, you can be free. Walk out of here a free person tonight, spiritually. No greater blessing could ever be bestowed. If you're not living a faithful Christian life, you're just as lost as you can be, but you can be rescued. Isn't that something? You can be rescued. Jesus wants you to come back home, and we want you to come back home, and we long for that. Why don't you do it while we stand together and sing?